Welcome to Zimmerman Podcast, episode 53. Today, I'm sitting down with Tracy Matthews. She's the creator of Tracy Matthews Jewelry, Creatives Rule the World, and Flourish and Thrive Academy. Tracy creates beautiful heirloom pieces that have been featured in stores around the world and worn by celebrities like Orlando Bloom and Halle Berry. I'm so excited to share our conversation with you today. Tracy and I are totally on the same page about how to capitalize on featured work, Pinterest marketing, the myth of overnight success, and more. Tracy has seen the ups and downs of being a businesswoman for a few decades now and has so much wisdom to offer about how to create a sustainable business and how to pivot when unexpected circumstances change your business. All right, you ready? Let's do it. Welcome to the Zimmerman Podcast with your host, CEO, wedding professional, educator, and mom, Jessica Zimmerman. In just two years, Jessica went from facing bankruptcy to taking home a six-figure salary. She turned a business-saving $100,000 loan into a million-dollar empire. As a creative entrepreneur, a healthy work-life balance seems just as unattainable as a six-figure income. But Jessica Zimmerman is here to show you it's possible. With the right tools and insider tips and some hard work, your craziest dreams can become your daily routine. If you set some boundaries and commit to healthy changes, you can create a business and a life you love. So let's make your business work for you. Welcome, Tracy. Thanks so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me, Jessica. I'm excited to chat. This is going to be fun. So you're a jewelry designer and an educator who creates stunning pieces that have collected quite the celebrity fan following. I cannot wait to talk a little bit more about that. But you've also been featured in magazines like Elle, Real Simple, and Martha Stewart Weddings. But for anyone who might be new to you and your work, could you tell us a little bit about your story? Yes, I would love to share a little bit about my story. So I've been a jewelry designer for a very long time, for over 25 years, and I started my career back in the 90s, um, basically just trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I was uh, taking, basically had a humanities major in college, and I took that major so that I could take fine art classes as electives, and I found jewelry making. So I kind of came about this in a really weird way, took this class and uh, realized that I really loved it. And I'd been working in fashion and retail for uh, many years to put myself through college. And this was sort of like the beginning of the independent designer scene. So I was like, you know, when you're like looking at, like kind of looking at people and you might be like, I want to be that when I grow up. So that was kind of how the whole thing started. I was working in boutiques and started seeing some of uh, these independent designers coming on the scene back in LA. And when I started started to design jewelry, people were always commenting on the pieces that I'd made and they were asking if where they could buy it. So I was like, I think there's something here. I'm going to start this side hustle business while I'm getting through college. And then eventually, like the goal is to actually start my business full time. So I ended up doing that in 1998 and uh, launched my first jewelry company, Tracy Matthews Designs. And that was super fun. I was, you know, just kind of figuring out it out as I went along. And back then in the 90s, the only way to really grow a successful jewelry company if you wanted to go big like I did, was to get into retail stores. So I, over the course of 11 years, was uh, featured in over 350 stores around the world, some really amazing accounts, and uh, had many iterations of my designs throughout that time. Like I started as a beaded jeweler and then evolved. I was a trained metalsmith, so eventually evolved into a metalsmith collection or a handmade collection is what it's called now. And then eventually launched a fine jewelry line in 2006. And that was sort of what put me on this next trajectory of what I do now, which is custom fine jewelry and primarily in the bridal and heirloom redesign markets. So a lot happened during that time. And you mentioned like I, you know, I had a lot of celebrity fans and a lot of uh, celebrity clients. Actually, like about two or three years ago, I designed a piece, Revlon commissioned me for a piece for Halle Berry. Uh, so that was super fun. It was her commemorative 20 year anniversary with them. Um, I've, you know, Hallie also had purchased uh, my jewelry independently of that. I am Jessica Alba, Orlando Bloom and uh, Michelle Williams. Charlize Theron were some of my pieces at the uh, UN talks uh, many years ago. So in 2006, I, I, as I mentioned, I launched my first fine jewelry collection and I was starting to get inquiries for 
um, engagement rings and wedding bands and also heirloom redesign pieces because a lot of people who would come to me knew that I, my mother had passed away uh, many years before and that I would wear a piece all the time that I redesigned for that. So during that time, you know, a lot was changing in the jewelry industry in particular with uh, the type of jewelry, not only that I was designing, but the the direction of the market. Um, I always have designed like really personal, special pieces that people keep for a long time. And at that point in time, and from 2006 to about 2009, there was this movement towards fast fashion. And I don't know if you remember that time, but like a lot of really big, bold pieces, people were buying like cheap costume jewelry as opposed to investing in nicer pieces. And so that caused a little bit of a, a shift in like the business modeling that I was doing. And then also when 2000, uh, September, 2008 happened and, and the market tanked and, you know, store everyone, consumer confidence went in the toilet. My wholesale stores were like left and right filing for bankruptcy. And that put me in a really bad position because I was shipping orders, like sometimes upwards of a hundred thousand dollars. And if you don't get paid for that, you're counting on that cash flow to come in. And so I had to make a really tough choice over that period to decide to keep the business open or close it. And I was working with a consultant at the time and he really helped me kind of dive deep into what it is that I was passionate about. And I realized that what I love doing was working with the customers, designing the jewelry, doing sales and like providing service to people. And what I spent most of my time doing back then was managing a team, dealing with logistics, making sure that we were like compliant with vendor guidelines and stuff like that. And it was kind of eating away my soul. That's the best way to describe it. <laughs> right. I can so relate to that because, um, and I think a lot of people can, when I was first doing weddings, I was, you know, doing them like multiple weddings a weekend. And I thought, oh, I just, this is not for me. I don't want to do it. And so I kind of reshift my business to where I was trying to, and it took a minute, but I had to work hard to attract an ideal client that where I could only do like four or five weddings a year, but they were bigger weddings and they were more intentional. And you're right. You work really closely with someone and it's a particular client, just like it's different. There, there are people who are going to buy a $25,000 piece of jewelry. And then there's people who want, you know, a $12 piece of jewelry. And so, gosh, yeah, that's quite a shift and it takes a little while to get there, but that's awesome that you've done it. Yeah. And I think part of that shift really came to the point. It's like, I was getting a little bit older and the jewelry that I was wearing was different. Like, you know, I, I was, I used to wear all, I mean, I still have like tons and tons of jewelry, obviously from my catalog of, of collection, but I started shifting and only wanting to wear like gold and like real, real jewelry. And I noticed that the people that were coming along with me, you know, as they were hitting like their forties and um, their fifties, they wanted pieces that were special and not just a lot of stuff. And so it became really important to me to be creating these pieces that people were not just like wearing for a season and getting rid of, but more things that they were going to keep for a lifetime and pass down for generations. And so that became more important to me and working, like you said, working with way fewer clients. You know, I was shipping like oftentimes thousands of pieces a month in my previous business. And now it's like the max capacity I can take right now because I have multiple businesses is max five customers a month for my jewelry company. So uh, because the process is so in-depth and um, intentional. And throughout that time, you know, I just kind of realized that what is important is that when you're guiding a business, I mean, this is just a general thing that I've, I discovered is that at different points in your career, you're going to want to do something different and it's okay to change your mind and move in a different direction and keep iterating and let go of the stuff that's not working for you anymore. Oh, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I, I, I feel like I'm, I pivot every couple of years. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I think some people find some shame in that and I, there's just no shame. You just, you're going to evolve and grow as your you know life goes. So you've got to just, you know, accept it, roll with it and do what feels right and uh, not feel like you have to be in the same thing your whole life. When you were a kid, because I think a lot of times we're, we're born, right, with these talents or these strengths, you know, they're just kind of God-given woven into our DNA. Were you someone who was constantly like playing in your mother's jewelry box? Yeah, I love jewelry. And uh, I remember all the special pieces. You know, my parents were like, 
super into the 80s, I guess I would say. And so my mom had all this like kind of extravagant jewelry. (laughs) And some of it, you know, it's like not really um, necessarily like in fashion these days. Like we have this one set of hers that was that was really beautiful. It's like this diamond choker that's like diamonds all around and these like fancy diamond swirl earrings. And the only time that anyone has ever been able to wear it is really like when they've gotten married (laughs) because it is so extravagant. So like for many years, we've been trying to figure out like, what do we do with that piece? Should we break it apart or something else? And it's still just even 25, she died about 25 years ago, 27 years ago. And even after all this time, it's still sitting in a, in a safe, we got to figure out what to do with it. That's so neat. So you just, you always knew you wanted to work with it. Well, I think, you know, as a kid, I was really creative and I thought I was going to be a fashion designer, quite frankly, or I would own a boutique. Like that was sort of from the time that I was in high school. It wasn't until I took that jewelry making class that I realized that, oh, it's jewelry because I didn't, I didn't really think of, you know, back then, you know, when I was a kid, a lot of the companies that made jewelry were these big, big companies, or they were like family jewelry houses. They weren't there was an independent designer. So I didn't even, it didn't really cross my mind at that time in my life. But uh, later on, you know, just when I started playing around with it, I, I love working with my hands. I love the design process. And I loved, I, I loved actually more than anything, the feedback people gave me from something that I had made and that they liked it. I was like, oh, that's so cool. You know? Yeah. That's really cool that you get to do that. It's so neat. So building a successful business is about more than creative genius. So what comes more naturally to you, the art of designing your pieces or the science of running a successful business? Well, I think it's both. You know, creativity is really, I think, the key to being successful. And what I mean by that is that a lot of times people think of creatives as artists, but creativity runs, you know, deep in so many different ways. And visionaries and founders and people who uh, typically start companies, most of them, not all of them, have a tendency to be highly creative, but they're not necessarily artists. And I truly believe that everyone, and this is just a little bit of a sidebar, everyone has their own zone of creativity and their own creative genius. And so even if, you know, like when I'm talking to like people who are like in banking and they're analysts and they're like, oh, I don't, I'm not creative at all. I'm like, yes, you are, because I can't do that thing, that creative thing that you did with the spreadsheet that your mind works that way. You know, I talk about this with my boyfriend all the time because I think most people think of creativity as art and it goes so much deeper than that. So I think that the creativity is the most important factor in being successful. And so what I really try to do in running my businesses is to focus on spending as much time doing the creative work that is going to drive my business forward. And what I mean by that is some is strategy, thinking outside of the box, creating inspiration for my team and the people that are following me, obviously creating beautiful designs for my jewelry clients and, and that sort of thing, but being strategic about growing the business. And that is really what I love to do the most is to be, is to spend a lot of time. And this is going to sound weird, just like thinking or coming up with ideas. Mm, yeah. I'm an idea person too. I wouldn't, I don't think I would have said that about myself, you know, growing up, but I definitely notice it more as an adult. I just constantly have ideas, even when I don't want them. That's the worst. I'm like, I don't want your idea right now. I just want to rest, but they come and it's crazy. Okay. So when there are aspects of your business that don't come naturally to you, how do you handle that? Do you have team members who balance you out? Like, how do you, how do you deal with it? Well, that's a great question. Uh, I am a, at this point, a master delegator and I always hand it out. But what the biggest lesson I learned in my first company was that I was spending so much time trying to improve my weaknesses instead of building my strengths. And I didn't realize that I was doing that at the time. I just thought that you had to do those things in order to be successful. And so uh, the second time around, the second phase of my career, I should say, um, when I launched a new jewelry company and now with Flourish and Thrive Academy and my Creatives Roll the World brand, I've realized, you know, like spending multiple hours doing technology when it's not my gift and I have the means to actually hire it out. It's not, I'd rather have someone else do it and spend my time doing the things that I'm good at. And so I've learned over the years that sometimes you have to do the things that don't come naturally in order to move your business forward until you don't have to do it again when you can start to outsource those things. And I'm sure that you talked to your audience about this as well, but I think 
um, a lot of that starts with just really identifying, number one, what you love to do, number two, what you're best at, and number three, what are the things that are actually driving your business forward as opposed to the things that are lower leveraged that someone else could actually do. And I think a lot of times people, when they're building businesses, spend so much time on the lower leverage stuff because it's easy to do and they could check things off their list and it feels like they're making progress. But what that actually does is it uh, inhibits you from growing quickly. And so I see this all the time because I mentor thousands of designers is that they get to a certain point and it's typically depending on their price point when they hit that six figure marker in revenue, when they're work, they start working way harder, but nothing changes and they, they start getting burned out. And the reason why they start getting burned out and nothing changes is because what worked for them up until that point, isn't going to work for them to get to the next level. Like they can't, keep doing it on their own because they're only as successful as their two hands. You know what I mean? Yeah. I call it being reactive versus proactive. It's just, oh, I'll do this because I know I can do it quickly and I know I can get it. And so it's reactive versus proactive, you know, doing the things you need to do to move your business forward. And you're right. The only way that's ever going to happen is when you bring on a team, when you start to do that. I hope this episode is blowing your mind so far. For years, I hated Pinterest and I held a grudge for the clients it stole from me when it first came out on the scene. But believe me when I say, Pinterest has earned my forgiveness. Today, I do almost all of my marketing through Pinterest and I get inquiries from big budget ideal clients every single week. If you want to start using Pinterest to get leads and money in the bank, you need the power of pinning. Check it out now at thepowerofpinning.com. How did you first get your work in front of people like Orlando Bloom and Charlie Theron and Halle Berry? Well, it was definitely a pro- uh, progression. Um, in the beginning, it typically happened by being placed in stores where celebrities were shopping. So early on, I think I was selling to Fred Siegel. And so that was helpful. I sold uh, to ABC Home, which was a really great account a little bit later on during that first Round. And then I started working with stylists who had, you know, connection, were styling the celebrities or had connections with them. And, you know, l- honestly, it was really about leveraging my network and a lot of people, because it's, it's a lot about who, you know, and I grew up in Southern California. Um, I went to school in LA and a lot, the school that I went to Loyola Marymount, uh, where I learned to make jewelry also had a huge program for, moving into the entertainment industry. And so I had a lot of friends who worked in entertainment after we graduated. And so that was helpful. One of my closest childhood friends I actually went to college with, and she is now the CMO of Disney, but for a very long time, she was in charge of many of the programs at Fox TV, not to be confused with Fox News, but Fox TV. And she was one of the shows that she was in charge of was American Idol. And that like that connection, I, I, you know, for many years, I really resisted even asking her for a favor, but I was like, Hey, Shannon, I know this is a lot, but you know, what do you think about this? Like, or can I come into your office and like show you some of the stuff? She's like, yeah, why? I don't even know why you didn't do this before. And so like, I think that that was a really interesting lesson for me because I'd been like too shy to even ask her. And she, I've known her for my entire life to even ask her for a favor and she's like, of course. She introduced me to the stylist. I was, I met the person who was in charge of Idol, and um, then she also helped me get placed on some of the other shows that they were doing. But Idol was like, at that time when it was still on Fox, was I had a men's line too, and my men's jewelry was very bold. So I think three or four of the American Idols, like just through that one connection, who won the season, who were men, were wearing my jewelry when they won, and so the stylist kept asking me like for more jewelry, more jewelry, not, not because it was going to make them win. Well, I can say that maybe, but the look was working. And so I developed these relationships and it, so it was a combination of things. That's really neat. Was one of them, um, Chris Allen? Yes. He's a good friend. Oh, he is. Yeah. I was just at his house, like right before the whole pandemic happened. Um, I was at his house because I was in Nashville recording my audio book. Yeah. He's got great style. I love it. So he he wore your jewelry and won. I love it. That was a long time ago though. Wasn't didn't he win like 10 years ago or something? Or yeah, something like that. 
Yeah, it, David Cook was another one. He was, I think, right before Chris Allen. I can't remember all the names. That's really neat. Yeah, Chris and I are from the same town. And so, and now he lives in Nashville, but we've kept in touch. He's great. Okay, so real quick, you were talking about getting into retail stores and stuff. And I, I just have a question because my best friend's sister sells jewelry and her pieces are from, you know, $100 to $300. Yeah. And she has to go, you know, boutique to boutique on her own by herself, you know, with her jewelry and pitch it, you know, and it, it that's, you've, you've got to be the biggest believer in, in your product. Right. And she has to, you know, pitch it. And so I'm just wondering what is the difference between getting into a boutique and is, you said you enjoyed sales. So was that something you did? And then also getting into retail stores, like I'm, I'm just assuming the, is the volume much different? Um, did you have to go through a lot of, you know, hoops to get into big retail stores? Well, it, you know, back then it was a little bit different and yes, the volume is quite different. And when I say retail stores, I'm also including boutiques. I sold to a lot of the small boutiques in uh, local areas and neighborhoods. Like that was like the mom and pop businesses were like the majority, like the bread and butter. And they're the ones, you know, like, especially when boutique shopping was really prominent, it's sad to me because I think those small boutiques, like they're the best places to shop. We love, we love work, working with them, but I got it, you know, for stores like anthropology, ABC home only has one location, but it is really prominent. And like a store like twist or something like that, or uh, Bloomingdale's those you're like jumping through bigger hoops or Sundance catalog. That was another really big account that I had. They ordered a lot from me and it takes a lot of time. And so I would never suggest someone who is just starting out with a jewelry or aspirational product business to start big. I would start small and build a, a really solid base of customers first and then move into some of these bigger things. But it's just really about being consistent and continually getting in front of them because you just don't know when they'll say yes. Because uh, I have a really great relationship with... Um, many of the buyers for years at a company called Uncommon Goods. I don't, I've never sold to them, but we've had them come in uh, because they do a lot of work with sustainable products and jewelry. And some of the designers, you know, the first time they pitch, they get picked up from them. But others, you know, it's taken them like a very long time to continually go over and over again. So what I would advise you is just keep making, make sure that your product is actually a good fit for the accounts that you're pitching. And then it's the right, the biggest mistake I see people doing is that they just like a store, but their jewelry is not really a good fit for it. And so make sure that it's really a good fit. And then just, just keep going because you never know when you're going to get that big thing. But I have to tell you is that I'm not sure that even these days that always working with some of the bigger stores is a great idea for a very specific reason. So much has changed in 10 or 15 years. You know, we're in the middle of a pandemic right now. And as we're recording this, I don't know when this will go live, but as we're recording this and wholesale stopped, you know, a lot of my designers that they're who I mentor, their orders have stopped shipping. And my message to them has been for the last, because I knew this was going to come. I went through 2008 I, and we had a really strong stretch of a great economy. And I'm like, something's going to happen and the economy is going to tank or we're going to have a setback. And the only way that you're going to protect yourself is if you can reach your customers directly. And so uh, we've been really focused on that for the last year and a half. And so when all this went down, I'm like, here we go. <laughs> we're going to dive in. And um, so I think it's, it's really important to have a multi-revenue stream strategy when you're building any sort of business that has to do with products, because uh, and you could do it specifically only online. I think that's the only time where I would say one revenue channel is a good option. But I think the most diversified and the way that you're going to make the biggest reach and impact is having a multi-channel stream. You just have to be patient because what you want is that when one starts to weaken is that the other ones can pick up. And what I'm seeing from a lot of my designers who have been doing the work and putting themselves out there and building their email list and building their audience direct to consumer during this time, even though they're having setbacks and maybe their sales have taken a little bit of a, a, a step back, they're making it up. Like I had in the last week, I've had like three designers message me, like literally take screenshots of their year over year sales from their Shopify stores. And I'm blown away. They're like selling like three times more than they did last year when the economy was strong online. So people are buying 
It's just the way that they're buying is different. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay. Back to celebrity for just a second. So when celebrities started noticing you, was it like overnight success or were people starting to see something somebody was wearing and then everyone wanted that particular piece? Like, what was that like? I love this question for so many reasons, because I think there's a big misconception about having celebrities wear your jewelry. Because I have to say, honestly, all it did was give me some credibility and social proof. Did it increase my sales? Maybe, but probably not. Like, I don't love that you're saying this. I don't. I think that um, this is really prom. I mean, this has been going on for a long time, but it's been really prominent for years. I can't, I've been, I would be um, solicited for these like celebrity gift bags and stuff like that. In the beginning, I do them. You pay $5,000 to get some pieces in there. It doesn't do anything for your sale or revenue. Maybe you get a picture of the celebrity wearing it, but it doesn't do anything for your sales. What it does offer you is credibility. And so I think that that is, that's the reason why you do it. Cause you can post a picture of, you know, one of those celebrities on your website with their permission, obviously, or I think when it would help is like, if a celebrity was shouting you out on their Instagram feed and actually doing some sort of unsolicited shout out it doesn't happen anymore because they all want to get paid to play because that's how they make money. So uh, back in the day when that would happen, I, I would say that's the only time it really works to help sales. I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think that that's so important for you to say, because I know for me, I have people who say you were getting these big you know, budget clients for weddings because you were featured in People Magazine or, and I'll be like, do you understand? My name was so tiny in like the bottom right corner. No one is looking at that. They are looking at the picture of the, of the bride and the groom. And that is all they care about. And I've gotten zero phone calls asking to do weddings from being featured in People Magazine. But what it gives me is like you said, credibility that I can put on my website. So when people do show up to my website, they see it and they go, oh, okay, this is credible, just like you. So I just think that's so fascinating because I think there's a lot of stuff out there that can, it's like shiny object syndrome when it comes to give us this and you'll get that or pay, buy this ad and look at all the stuff you'll get in return. And you just have to really, really, you know, be careful about that because it can, it doesn't always lead to sales. I think that's an interesting point because I don't think that advertising really works until you have money to just throw in the trash. (laughs) And the reason why I say that is because a lot of, specifically for products, because it really takes someone oftentimes seven seven to 10 touches from the first time they see your work somewhere to the time that they buy. And so that might mean like, you know, back in the day, we would say like, oh, they'd see it in a magazine. And if it was that, do you remember a magazine called Lucky? Yeah, totally. So Lucky, I love getting in Lucky because that was the one where uh, you would act, Lucky and InStyle were the ones that you would make sales from. The rest of them were great just for exposure, but it didn't, they weren't necessarily sales drivers like Lucky and InStyle were back in the day. And so you'd always want to get in Lucky or InStyle because you'd make sales from it. And one of the things that I think a lot of designers go to is like they get pitched by a magazine for an advertorial. That's not going to do anything for you. Or they want to go straight to running like Facebook ads because they want to get more traffic and sales to their website. But that's not really the best way to do it because it will take a long time for you to recoup that money. And you're also competing with all these big brands who are targeting the same audience that have big budgets. So the likelihood of your ads actually being successful, unless you're really strategic about how how you're working it, and you have a retargeting strategy, isn't it's going to be not even worth your money. So I would always I always recommend that people just focus on getting press and getting, you know, that social proof that comes with getting press and getting celebrity placements, but being smart about how, like the investment that that, that's taking and then leveraging that later to build your audience, but for free, not by paying for it. Do you know what, uh, how I get 90% of my sales? How? Is through Pinterest. Yeah. Oh my God. So good. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you upkeep your website properly and you treat it, you know, like the most important thing, like a, like a 24 hour a day, seven day a week employee, 
uh, that's just constantly, you know, shouting out what you do and telling people um, what you offer. And then you, you know, spend five minutes a day pinning those things. You, you spend five minutes a day, you get five years worth of clients because that, that those pins get repinned and repinned and shared. And it just constantly drives traffic to your website. You know, unlike Instagram, where you get penalized if you take people away from the platform. That's what Google was built for, just to, you know, lead people to other sites. And so I just always think if anybody's needing, you know, help with sales in, in the product world, even in the service world, that there's just no better place to go than Pinterest. Cause it's like a visual search engine. I mean, you could go in and you could Google engagement ring styles and all your stuff could show up and somebody would, they, they weren't planning on buying that day, but then they find it and they see it. They go, Oh my gosh, that's the one I want. That's the exact one I want. And then it clicks to your website and then they're calling you. You know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. Pinterest is so great for products, especially jewelry. I've gotten a lot of referrals through Pinterest for my uh, jewelry company. And I know uh, many of the designers in our community have built businesses off of like a single pin, which is crazy. That is, yes, that's what I'm saying. Yes. Oh, thank you for saying that. You can. You can build a whole business off a single pin. It's incredible. And for those of you who are listening, you know that if you go to thepowerofpinning.com, I got a whole thing all about it. So you can learn all about it. Okay. So tell me, because you're also involved in other projects like Creatives Rule the World and Flourish and Thrive Academy. When did you realize you wanted to expand into education? Well, I was, so I started the new company in 2010 and after I closed my business at the end of 2009, that's when I like wound the whole thing down. 2010, I took about six months off, started teaching yoga more full time and just kind of going through this existential crisis. Like, am I going to continue designing jewelry or not? And what's the next step? I decided that I wanted to. So I really launched that next company, um, which is just like I design under my own name still in the summer of 2010. And within 18 months, like I'd built that business to be super successful very, very quickly, like so much more quickly than my other business. And I real and I was making way more money having this small lifestyle kind of business than having like a business that was doing seven figures in revenue here in my previous uh, thing, because that thing was like a machine. I had to invest so much money back into it to keep that machine going. And so During that time, because I did have a lot of press and a lot of celebrities, this is what it also helps for, people would reach out to me and say like, hey, can I pick your brain or take you to coffee or can you share with me how you launched your business or whatever? And it's funny because like in the early days when we started, I started Flourish and Thrive Academy with my friend Robin Kramer. She has her own uh, wholesale company where she mentors wholesale designers who want to do wholesale. Uh, That's more of her focus now. Um, But when we started the Flourish and Thrive Academy together, several of the students that we first started in were like pulling out these press clippings of different things. And one of them sent me a message like, oh, my gosh, I've been following. I didn't even realize it, but I've been following you for like eight years. And look at what I just found in like my files. And so all that stuff helps to work to build credibility. So even many years later, people were reaching out to me saying like, hey, you know, I've been following you for a long time. Can you help me? And so I started consulting with a couple of brands and some of them like, you know, dove in and bought my consulting packages and others were like, oh, well, I can't really afford to invest more than a month. And you're not going to get much for a month of consulting. Like you're not going to really move the needle forward unless it's a very specific targeted thing that we're working on. And so, and a lot of these people were just starting out and there's so much, and you know, like when you're starting a business, there's so much that needs to happen. And so I had first kind of come across my first online class and I was like, oh, people do this online education thing. Like I was clueless. <laughs> right. Totally. Totally. <laughs> and uh, so I was like, well, maybe I could dial all my knowledge into like a course or two. And so Robin and I were talking and I was like, I think there's two programs here. One is like for people just starting out. And then the next one is like basically the business systems that you need to run a jewelry company. And so we launched our Laying the Foundation program in the summer of 2012. That was basically the information that it would take to consult with me for like a year of everything that you needed to get your brand off the ground. And so that program was like the seed or the beginning of of like this company that we've been doing for a very long time. And Creatives World of World came about because as an entrepreneur, I've been an entrepreneur for, like I said, for 25 years, 
you know, I, I really observed like the seasons of my businesses and when I felt most alive working and when I, you know, felt really drained and wanting to like throw in the towel or, you know, close a business or whatever. And I realized that in those times that when I felt drained and uninspired and like, wa- like wanting to like throw in the towel or move in a different direction, regardless of the financials, because my businesses have been doing well for many years, it always had to do with my energy and the way, how much, how much time I was spending being creative. <laughs> and mm. so I started interviewing people and talking to them and I started exploring this idea a little bit more. And then I started doing things to protect my creative energy and being really adamant about it. And I noticed like a huge shift, not only in my productivity, but also in the amount that we were able to get done as a company and the level or the extent at which I could was becoming like a better leader. And that's how Creative Rule of the World really came about. It's um, basically a platform. <laughs> I'm writing a book. I'm also, it's kind of funny because like I've been working really hard on my signature talk <laughs> but about protecting creativity and uh, creativity types and stuff like that for the past year. And now, now all the live events are canceled. So we can't even, you know, no, it's fine. Uh, it, they'll come back. Um, they will, they will. But really that platform is really a place for founders, creatives, and people to go who are trying to build successful businesses in alignment, not only with what they want and their goals, but in a way that they spend most of their time doing what they love instead of the things that they hate. And I think sometimes when people start a business and, uh, you know, you probably read the book, The E-Myth Revisited, it's like an old classic or whatever. But one of the things that Michael Gerber talks about in that book is that most people start a business because they're good at something. And then they realize that over time, like that thing that they're good at is a thing that they start to hate. But I think it's really the evolution of finding multiple things that you're good at so that you can build the systems and the support system around you so you can keep spending your time on the things that light you up and enjoy you, which isn't always the thing that you started the business, the reason why you started the business or the thing that you started doing then. Uh, Because I think as you go through this process of self-discovery, you realize, oh, well, I'm really good at a lot of things in my business and not in some other things, not so much. How can I spend more time doing the things that are actually going to move the needle and grow that are most leveraged? And how can I delegate the things that are not? I'm feeling everything you just said right there, because I think so many people do that. They go into something with one thing that they're good at, and then they, you're right, we start to hate it. And then you start to realize, but what I think it is, is I think it's almost a crumb along the journey to who you're actually supposed to be, what you're actually supposed to be doing. So that's kind of getting your foot in the door. You're like, oh, I love this. I feel comfortable with this. I'm good at this. And so you start that business. And then you start, because for me, never in a million years would, would me or anyone who knew me have, have thought that I would have the business that I have today. No one. I mean, I, and including me, I would have never thought that I would be a businesswoman. You know, um, I think everyone assumed that I'd have this little side hobby job that was (laughs) not really a job, but you know, something that I, pretended was, um, which I had for a minute. And then, um, but then I started to learn other things and I started to like it. You know, you're exposed to things and you're like, Oh, Oh, I didn't know. Okay. And you know what I loved the most was when I worked for other people, I would have an idea and they would go, okay, yeah, well, we'll talk about that next month or something. Mm -hmm. And for me, when I have an idea, I can execute it right away. Yeah. And at least get the ball rolling. And so it was so satisfying. Okay. So how can creatives and business owners like you find clarity when feeling the urge to branch out into something new or different? I think, uh, how can they find clarity? Um, I think getting clear on, I mean, first and foremost, I think spending time with space (laughs) around you. And I think this is a really interesting concept because I think, uh, especially for those of us living in the U S like productivity and getting things done is really value valued. <laughs> so I think creating the space around you to have time to think, I think, you know, one of the hardest things that people do in their businesses or, or even like in general, when they're trying to concept an idea or dive into, um, the next phase of what they're doing is they try to like sandwich creativity or creative work 
in between like meetings and appointments and calls. But I don't know if you've ever sat down and you've noticed that right before you're supposed to stop and do something else is when like the best ideas are when everything starts to flow. And so all that stuff, like if you want to like really tap into your creativity and dive into like figuring out what to do, like it's going to require some space and time to think and for for you to just kind of sit with it for a while. And so uh, I do something uh, in my schedule. Wednesdays are my creative days. Wednesdays and Fridays are usually like the most open days for me in my week. And uh, that's the time when I'm working on the most creative work or the things that are going to drive the business forward or the stuff, the ideation process of coming up with new ideas or concepts or pivoting or uh, that's how Creatives World the World actually came about was during, on one of these creative days when I was like, you know, this is really fascinating. And I'm not- noticing this trend between the creatives that I'm working with and I'm teaching them these things. Like, how can I dial this in to a message to help the next people? And so it's really about just sitting with it for a while. And I don't have any like, with the exception of protecting your creative energy, I don't have any like specific advice for that, except that create time and space to think grab a journal, sketchbook, whatever it is, and put that into your regular schedule because that's going to be the thing that's going to help you really get clear on the direction to move forward. And I think the second step of this is to really start getting feedback. Um, You don't really know if what you're doing in feedback from the right people. Let me just be clear about this because friends and family tell you either don't do it, you're stupid for starting a business and I think you're dumb, go get a regular job or they will tell you things like, oh, it's great. I love it. And that's, neither of those are helpful. Right. Like what you want is like constructive feedback. You want it to bounce the things off with people who would be your customers or who might actually be buying into this product. And like, for instance, when we started Flourish and Thrive Academy, I started curating this email list and I would ask them like, what do you need help with the most? And so we started, we would had this survey and they would win like a free coaching session with us. This was back in the day. And that's how we got information from what our audience wanted. And, you know, as, as you begin to build and you have more people following you, you can start asking more questions and figure out what it is that of your ideas or concepts or products, even that people like. And one of the things that we teach at Flourish and Thrive Academy is to put your products out there and see what the feedback is. If people aren't buying, it doesn't mean that you're a bad designer but you'll just know like what are the things that appeal to your audience the most and that's what you go into. It doesn't mean that you need to ditch all the other stuff, but it it does mean that it gives you clarity on like what to stock inventory for or like what you like the kinds of things that people actually want from you. Totally. And often it's just you know, it's not that your idea is bad or that your product's bad. I mean, just to give an example, last year when I launched the Power of Pinning, the first day we launched it, we had 800 views in the morning. Wow. And it converted into two sales. And I was like, something's not right here. (laughs) (laughs) Something's not right. And so the team and I kind of spent the rest of the day going, what is wrong with our sales page? What is on here that's making people, because people are showing interest because they're here. Mm -hmm. So what, why is it not converting? And then we just, we brainstormed, we changed some things and then things worked out. But it's, if I had looked at that and said, oh, it's just a terrible program, you know what I mean? It, then it, you can't do that. You can't just give up. You've got to really look at it and see, you know, uh, what you can do or, or what is the real problem. Um, I, you said you're a yoga instructor. I used to teach yoga. I just practice now, but I taught yoga for about 15 years uh, on and off. It was a total accident. It wasn't something I was trying to do. I just fell into it. Sleeping with a Stranger is officially available everywhere books are sold in hardcover, paperback, ebook, and audiobook. Since the book's launch, I've been amazed by how it's been received. From being named a bestseller by USA Today, The Wall Street Journal, Amazon, and Barnes and Noble, to incredibly personal and touching reviews from my amazing readers, it's been such a wild journey. Here's one of my favorite reviews. If you're even remotely on the fence about getting this book, just go ahead and purchase it. I promise you won't regret it. I normally don't write a lot of reviews, but in this case, it was a must. Jessica gives you a total glimpse into her and her family's life. She not only tells the story, but she tells it with a sense of humor while also being completely open and honest. I truly believe everyone can get something out of or relate to her story in some way. 
I honestly cannot emphasize just how much I loved this book. I will definitely be purchasing more to give to friends and family. I can't wait to share this story with you. To get your copy, go to jessicazimmerman.com today or wherever books are sold. And to make sure you get all my upcoming book tour updates, join the newsletter list now. Okay, I've got one more question. I know I've kept you too long, but I, I've got one more question for you. I ask everyone this question. I always think it's fun. So if you had Oprah money, like billions of dollars, and you had to spend it on yourself, something totally selfish, what would you buy? Well, I probably a lot of things if I had that kind of money. Um, I think I would get probably a personal chef. Um, I usually live in New York City, so I eat out a lot, but I'm, I moved to Arizona temporarily during this uh, pandemic to just spend time with my boyfriend and be in more open space. And uh, man, we're cooking a lot and I, I, don't, I enjoy cooking and I think I'm a relatively decent cook, but it takes a lot of time <laughs> yeah. like eating delicious food. So I probably find, hire a personal chef, plus just as a guilty pleasure, like something that I've always wanted to do. Like I don't have children. I don't plan to have children. I have a lot of nieces and nephews. Really what I would like to do for them is to, or like to do yeah, for them is to help them start a business. And that that's for me because I believe in entrepreneurship so much that I think it would be amazing if many of them became entrepreneurs. And I have like 21 nieces and nephews at this point. And then also I'd have homes in multiple cities, a uh, penthouse in New York, uh, something in Europe and something on the West Coast. I mean, you have that kind of money. Why not? Why not? Absolutely. I also love how unapologetic you were right there about saying, I don't have kids. I'm not having kids. Because <laughs> many people feel like so many women feel like they have to like explain that and you don't. So I love it. I love it. You, you, you live your life, man. Do your own thing. I love it. We all need to just support one another. Um, okay. Oh my gosh, Tracy, this has been so great. I, I feel like I've learned a lot. You have been so delightful to talk to, tell everyone where they can, you know, find you and maybe be one of those, you know, five customers a month who can, who can get <laughs> on your jewelry. Awesome. Well, you can find me on my website, tracymatthews.com. Um, if you're interested in the other websites, you can just Google Flourish and Thrive Academy or Creatives Rule the World and both will pop up. And you can find me on Instagram at tracymatthewsny. Perfect. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Tracy, thank you so much for sharing with us and being so honest and willing to share. I love what Tracy said about how the economic downturn of 2009, which caused her to close her first business, taught her to prepare for the new buying habits that come along with COVID-19, which is what we're currently experiencing. It just goes to show that what may seem like our biggest failures can turn into our greatest successes. Every perceived failure is a chance to learn so that you can move forward with a stronger business. Thanks for listening along today. I'll see you back here on Zimmerman Podcast. If you loved what you heard today, even if you liked it a lot, you should subscribe and leave a review. We'll see you back here next time in the Zimmerman Podcast.